Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the colloquium. Uh, my name is Stephen Julian. I'm a professor here, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Fazal Tafti from Boston College. Um, it's especially a pleasure because he's one of our own. Fazal did his PhD in our department uh, some time ago, and he's taken a slightly different, unusual path to where he is now. So I thought I'd tell you about that since he didn't have anything else he wanted me to say particularly. So I don't know how many of you have read Kafka, but he has this nice book called The Metamorphosis, where one morning someone wakes up in bed and they've turned into a giant insect. So Fazal started out here as a, as a theoretical physicist for his masters. But then one morning he woke up and he had metamorphosed into an experimentalist. And he actually did his PhD in my research group. Um, and he produced actually a beautiful PhD thesis. It was very nice. Not much to do with me, I have to say. I He was one of these th students who just sort of stood back and let them get on with it. And then after he graduated from Toronto, he went and did a PhD with Louis Taifer and continuing similar work. But then again, one morning, Fazo woke up and he had moved even further down the evolutionary scale <laughs> and he had turned into a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> so he did a PhD with Bob Kava at Princeton, and he's one of the uh, superheroes of the field, I would think. Condensed matter physics is really driven by the discovery of new materials, and Kava was great at it. And there was a, a whole generation of people like Bob Kava working. But um, one of the great relief, a great relief for all of us, is that there are some young people like Fazel who have moved in to take to take their place. So uh, Fazel is going to tell you about his work um, in developing uh, new materials for us. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you for the very uh, kind introduction, Steve, and thank you, Arun, for the invitation and Paul for organizing this uh, this colloquium. Um, my talk is going to be about chemistry insight into physics uh, problem, as you could, probably would have guessed from Professor Julian's introduction. Um, if this works. Uh, I'm going to start with the uh, acknowledgments of uh, uh, the, all the people who helped my career, which started since 2016 at Boston College. Uh, many national labs uh, have played an, a, big, a big role in characterization of the new materials that are made in my group. Uh, also, academic collaborators helped a lot uh, with various types of measurements on these materials. I show some of those data today, and also funding agencies who uh, made the work possible. Um, I have a quantum materials program at Boston College. We make a variety of system from quantum spin liquids to polaronic metals, materials with extreme magnetoresistance, resistance, superconductors, chiral materials, Van der Waals materials. But uh, for the purpose of today's uh, presentation, I decided to discuss two physics problems, uh, which was addressed in my group by making new materials for. Um, and the reason I chose these two problems is because these two problems are, are somewhat uh, related to my education here at uh, this physics department in University of Toronto. Um, and, uh, and so I would uh, make some, uh, I want to make this talk somewhat personal because I was a student of this department. And so I'm going to make some flashbacks to the memories that I have from uh, my graduate uh, school times. Uh, the first topic is topology and magnetism. Um, I would like to very briefly um, motivate this work, um, topology, uh, has been uh, has been playing an important role in the field of condensed matter since about uh, 20 years ago. Um, and uh, a brief introduction to that comes from Dirac equation, uh, uh, which basically whose solution are uh, fermions and electrons particularly, um, which with which condensed matter people work a lot. Um, but uh, maybe one year after Dirac proposed his, uh, his equation, Hermann Weil proposed a different version of Dirac's equation where the mass term was put to zero. And the result of uh, this equation in three dimensions is a Hamiltonian, which is given by the inner product of momentum and spin. And such a Hamiltonian uh, creates uh, uh, chiral degrees of freedom uh, in the sense that the right going uh, particles uh, have a different spin than the left going particles. Um, and so because these part, the, the solutions to this uh, equation are massless chiral particles, people thought that neutrinos uh, in the standard model of particle physics could be a solution to this equation. 
But of course, in 2015, we learned that was a Nobel Prize, actually a Canadian Nobel Prize, uh, was given to the, uh, to the determination of the mass of neutrinos. So we know that neutrinos are massive, so they're not exactly a solution to this equation. Uh, so uh, while fermions were not found at high energies, uh, as uh, free particles. Uh, instead, they were some, interestingly, they were actually found as low energy excitations in condensed matter materials. Uh, one of the examples of these materials is tantalum arsenide. It's perhaps one of the best studied wild semi-metals. It's a material that hosts these wild particles. Um, a very brief introduction to this physics comes from a, basically in topological materials, you have a uh, inversion between the conduction and valence band uh, inside uh, the bulk of the material. Here is a three-dimensional rendering of that band inversion. At the point where the bands cross and invert, you have linearly dispersing, um, dis linear dispersions. Uh, sometimes that, uh, that dispersion can be completely lifted due to perturbations in a material, and you get something called a topological insulator, or TI. And sometimes uh, th there are points in the band structure where these, uh, these linear crossing are not lifted, uh, specifically in materials that lack a center of inversion, such as tantalum arsenide, this can happen. And these materials are known as uh, wild semimetals, or WSM. Uh, and it was also theoretically conjectured that having such exotic states in the bulk of the material leads to even more exotic state on the surface of the material. In topological insulators, for example, you can have surface states with momentum spin locking. In wild semimetals, you can have something that's called a Fermi arc, arc-like states uh, with spin momentum locking on the surface of the material. And these things have been, in fact, uh, experimentally resolved using angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy. For example, in tantalum arsenide, you can see the wild crossings. We call them wild nodes. They always come in pairs. Uh, one is the source and the other one is the sink of a geometric phase called Berry phase. Uh, and the arcs that you see between them are the Fermi arcs on the surface of the material. Um, so this, this work um, has been, uh, of course, done uh, uh, maybe a, for example, this publication is from 2016, but the, the work on this material has been done since maybe 2010s. And in fact, uh, I would like to flash back to uh, this department at the University of Toronto. There has been also uh, plenty of important and in fact seminal work on these uh, on the, on this exotic electronic phases, spe specifically on wild semimetals. This is, for example, I think one of the uh, sort of most popular plots that people show when they talk about uh, sort of phase, like topological phases of materials. It's a work from the group of Professor Yong Bak Kim, uh, who looked at the tuning of spin orbit coupling and electronic correlations, where they were basically looking at different uh, topological phases in correlated materials. Um, the student who was doing this work is uh, was uh, uh, William. Wilczek Krempa, uh, uh, he was a contemporary of mine. We were PhD students together. We had plenty of discussions about these uh, wild semi-metals, uh, lots of beer in the pub called Einstein. I don't know if it's still there or not. Um, and in fact, I also, at the time, Professor Julian uh, and I decided to also work on this, uh, on one of one candidate for this phase, Europium uh, Iridate, Europium 2 Iridium 2 Oxygen 7. My PhD was focused on pressure experiment, uh, supervised by Professor Julian. And we basically found an insulator to metal transition where the, the, the idea was that the metallic phase seems to be a wild semi-metal. Um, now, William has gone to be a faculty. He's currently a professor at the University of Montreal, a child of this department who's doing very, very nice work still, and we're still good friends in contact with each other. I hope that when I flash back to good memories from my PhD, it would be somewhat encouraging to the graduate students in the audience. I'm sure all of you are doing fantastic work uh, and you are in a really wonderful department. Okay, going back to the talk. Um, so um, I, after I graduated from U of T, I learned a lot about wild semimetals, but I did not work on this topic. Uh, I went to two postdocs, as Professor Julian mentioned, and I actually worked on other things, particularly superconductors. But when I started my career at Boston College, I went back to this problem. I knew that there were a lot of nice work on the electronic properties of wild semimetals, for example, the possibility of quantum Hall effect in the bulk of these materials, or chiral anomaly, which is a type of negative magnetoresistance in such materials. There were other anomalies that were also 
uh, predicted, uh, for example, the Z2 anomaly. Again, from this department, Professor Yoma Kim predicted that anomaly. Uh, so lots of beautiful work was done uh, on uh, electronic properties of wild semi-metals, but not much work was done on the magnetic magnetism driven by these wild electrons. And when I started my career 10 years after graduating from here, I basically decided to write my first proposal on magnetism driven by wild semi-metal. It was something that I learned here, but it took me a, a, a while to kind of do this research myself. And uh, that was my first proposal and it got funded. So again, things you learn in this department will be very, very helpful to you. Maybe not, maybe, maybe sometimes you don't see it right away, but 10 years down the road, you'll, you'll see that it's very, very useful things that you learn in your PhD. So here was the sort of the general outline of the idea. Uh, if you have these uh, wild nodes uh, in a wild semi-metal, um, they, it is possible that there would be some kind of a nesting condition between uh, Fermi surfaces that contain these wild nodes, and that could drive magnetism, specifically if there is a coupling between these relativistic chiral charges and local magnetic moments in a material. Um, and the heuristic idea at the time, for me at least, was that these are chiral relativistic charges. So if they have some coupling to magnetic moments in a material, they may be able to mediate a spiral. Uh, magnetism. In a sense, the, chiral, the intrinsic chirality of the charge degrees of freedom may kind of tr transform to um, exotic magnetic states. So with that in mind, uh, I designed this sort of, I started designing this family of materials, the rare earth aluminum silicide. The design principle was uh, to basically make a unit cell, which is exactly like tantalum arsenide, the same space group I4 sub 1 MD. It's a non-center symmetric crystal structure. The aluminum and silicon elements are non-metallic, and they basically form the same wild semi-metallic phase that you have in tantalum arsenide. But then uh, when you have rare earth atoms there, the rare earth atoms will provide, with, um, provide you with local moments with the spins. And now you have a system that has wild uh, conduction electrons, but it also has local moments. And you hope that these two kind of interact with each other and some kind of magnetism is developed due to that interaction. Now, the reason for making such, a, such systems, uh, the interest in making such systems is that spiral magnetism can lead to topological magnetic defects known, uh, known as uh, skirmions, and skirmions will, are very useful for uh, high density and high speed magnetic memory. Um, so we could basically engineer the band structure of the, of the wild fermions, and in, you, with band structure engineering, the hope is to also engineer the magnetic state of the material and hopefully make things that are spiral. Okay, let me, all right. Um, yeah, so that was supposed to go like that, sorry. So going from real space um, to momentum space, um, we performed ARPES or uh, angle result for the emission spectroscopy on this material. The first material my group made is cerium aluminum silicon. And we looked, uh, we basically found the Y nodes in this system and also surface Fermi arcs in the material. And also we compare that uh, electronic structure to the bands, uh, to, the, uh, to the band structure. And uh, basically this was just a check to make sure that the system is indeed a wild semi-metal. These are the points of linear band crossing uh, or the Y nodes that you see in these ARPES images. So now we have a, uh, a wild semi-metal uh, and it is magnetic, it has magnetic ions in it. Um, the goal is to find some kind of a spiral magnetism in the system. In cerium aluminum silicon, we did not exactly find spi spiral magnetism, but we found non-collinear ma uh, magnetism. Um, this material, in fact, attracted a lot of attention, especially because it has beautiful, large uh, ferromagnetic domains. And these domains uh, seem to be tunable by either um, light or by current. And so there's actually quite a bit of work done on this material, cerium aluminum silicon. Uh, there's also some recent theoretical uh, work from uh, Professor Paramekanti, who is uh, studying the sort of the, in the, intera the interaction of wild electrons and ferromagnetic domains to understand the transport properties of these materials. Um, so this was not a spiral magnet, but it actually became a very interesting non-collinear magnet and, and people are doing a lot of work on them. Uh, but we were uh, after spiral magnetism. So then we marched along the, um, the uh, sort of uh, lanthanide series in the periodic table. Uh, after cerium aluminum silicon, my group studied neodymium aluminum silicon. 
And in this material, we actually found some evidence of spiral magnetism. This uh, system has a ferry magnetic order which spin up, down, down. It's shown also in this top figure. So it's a cross section, up, down, down. But you can hopefully see in the picture that the spin downs are have some kind of a relative uh, phase with respect to each other. And that phase is actually a spiral modulation. So it was the first evidence of some kind of a spiral modulation which was related to the to this uh, sort of having wild electrons in the system. Uh, and then after, but it was not a full spiral order. But after this system, we studied samarium aluminum silicon. And in samarium aluminum silicon, we found a full blown spiral order. Uh, and also in retrospect, we found why uh, spiral order appears in samarium aluminum silicon. The reason for this material to, sh to exhibit the spiral order is because of its weak magnetocrystalline anisotropy. Uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy is the tendency of spins to orient along a certain crystallographic direction. Uh, for example, this is a picture of a crystal of cerium aluminum silicon. The spins can be in plane or out of the plane. Uh, so here I'm showing some magnetic susceptibility data. Uh, susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility measured along the C axis divided by the A axis. If you look at this ratio in cerium aluminum silicon, which is the red data, it goes to very small values, which means that the A axis susceptibility is about 200 times larger than C axis susceptibility. So this system really likes to put the spins in plane. Um, the neodymium aluminum silicon goes the opposite trend. Uh, the C axis susceptibility is about 80 times larger than the A axis. So this system likes to put the spins out of plane. But in samarium aluminum silicon, this ratio hovers around one, even at low temperatures. And so this system doesn't have a strong magnetocrystalline anisotropy, and therefore the spins can rotate. They're not forced to be in plane or out of plane. And so that was basically how we really realized that in order to establish spiral order in wild semi-metals, uh, you probably want to look for materials with weaker uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy. Um, the, uh, the spiral order itself was detected by uh, neutron scattering. We found a wave vector, one third, one third, zero, which is the wave, the wave vector for the propagation of, of the spins in, uh, in the magnetic structure of the material. And interestingly, we found that this wave vector is the same ve wave vector uh, that connects the Y nodes in the material. So there seems to be some kind of a nesting between the Y nodes that coincides with the magnetic wave vector in, in the spiral order state of this material. So this is another evidence for why semi-metals actively participating in the magnetic uh, interactions in this material. The other interesting thing that we found was that uh, was to map the magnetic the magnetic phase diagram of the system, the field and temperature magnetic phase diagram of the system. We found a variety of phases, but I would like to just bring your attention to a, a phase at the center of this phase diagram. It is called a Phase. I know it's not a great name, but this is sort of uh, it, this terminology comes from materials that are well established skirmion systems, such as manganese silicide. There is a phase in their phase diagram uh, which can be accessed only by crossing the boundary of other phases, and therefore they usually require more than one wave vector to as to be established. And this was not known uh, early on, but later people realized that these are exactly these kind of skirmion textures or a lattice of these skirmions. So that makes this A phase. And we find something that phenomenologically looks similar uh, to skirmion materials, which makes it very interesting because now we have a wild semi-metal that potentially has a skirmion phase in it. Um, and another evidence for that is to observe what we call a topological Hall effect, which is basically a peak-like structure in the Hall effect after subtracting the background data, which is shown in the main uh, panel here. And we find that this kind of peak-like structure in the Hall effect is only observed when you are in the temperature and field boundaries of that A phase. When you go to higher or lower temperature or higher or lower fields, you lose the signal. And the signal to some extent is, is a kind of a characteristic of this skirmion excitation. So this was another evidence for uh, having spiral order and possibly skirmion excitations in this wild semi-metal. <clears throat> okay, so that was uh, that was the the first problem that we studied in my group uh, and used chemistry insight and also things that I learned during my PhD here. Uh, I applied to basically my own independent career later on. 
The second problem, which is also rooted in the stuff I learned in this department, is the problem of quantum spin liquid. Um, this is a field where uh, this, this department uh, has truly played a very, very important role in its development. Um, now, quantum spin liquid uh, is, uh, let me maybe just motivate a little bit the research. Um, um, we are working on a specific type of, a specific phase of matter, which is called matter, which is called Kitaev spin liquid. Um, uh, this um, phase of matter was introduced by Alexei Kitaev in 2006 uh, through basically solving, exactly solving a Hamiltonian, which describes spin half particles on a honeycomb lattice where the spins have a um, strange bond directional interactions. Different components of spin uh, interact along different bonds of the lattice. For example, Z component along the red bond or X component around the blue, one, blue, uh, blue bond or the Y component along the uh, green line. And, um, and Alexei Kitaev introduced this Hamiltonian and he solved it exactly. And he showed that the ground state of such a system is massively frustrated. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it is called a spin liquid because in the ground state, such a system can flu fluidly uh, tunnel between different ordered states. All these ordered states are degenerate. And so the material is highly correlated, but it never selects a specific magnetic ordering and frees into it. it. It has a fluidity to always go, to kind of go across different phases, magnetic phases, and therefore we call it a spin liquid. But even more than that, he showed that when, uh, when there is such a massive uh, uh, degeneracy and magnetic frustration in the ground state, the electrons fractionalize into uh, Majorana particles. Majorana particles are their own antiparticle. And this, um, this is actually a way of creating a thermodynamic phase that can automatically generate Majorana fermions. And, and these particles are also useful for topological quantum computation, which is fault tolerant. So it, it was a very interesting theoretical proposal, but it wasn't, I, I don't think if the importance of it was, was understood early on uh, until a few years later, uh, when two uh, theorists, in fact, from Max Planck Institute, Jacqueline and Halyunin, proposed that there are actually materials where this physics can emerge. And so then this physics was kind of, it, it, it had some kind of a um, material foundation and people became more interested in it. Um, the materials that they proposed were lithium iridate and sodium iridate. These are iridium oxides. Iridium are the pink atoms. They form a honeycomb lattice. And the special arrangement of D, uh, five electrons in the D shell of iridium leads to an effective spin half in this system. So it is indeed, it satisfies the basic criteria of the Kitaev model, spin half particles on a honeycomb lattice, because iridium has a strong spin orbit interaction that also gives a sense of directionality to the spin interactions because the spins and orbital degrees of momentum are kind of locked in this system. So there's some anisotropy in magnetic interactions. These materials have been studied since then. Um, I, I, I lost count of how many papers are published on these systems. Uh, lithium iridate and sodium iridate, uh, they do show a massive frustration, but they order magnetically at around 15 Kelvin, which means that these systems must have at least another term in their Hamiltonian that favors magnetic ordering. And that the first thing to consider is Heisenberg interaction. However, later on, uh, the group of Professor Hayan Ki uh, found that there is another term which has been somewhat uh, uh, sort of missed in all of this, which is symmetry allowed for the Hamiltonian of these systems. And it actually plays a really important role in determining the exact magnetic ground state of, of these materials. That term is called symmetric off-diagonal exchange interaction. Um, uh, and this is, or, or simply said, the gamma term. And they, uh, they, they propose that this term is important and using now the three uh, magnetic exchange couplings, gamma, J, and K, they showed a, a, what we call a global phase diagram of Kitaev materials. And following their works, there has been plenty of other works to basically dissect this phase diagram using all these competing interactions. Um, and it, it really became, I would say, almost a theoretical industry, in fact, to create phase diagrams of these materials with different sort of the different strength of these interactions. Again, the student who was uh, involved with uh, at least the work that I'm showing here was Jeff Rao. He was also another contemporary of my time. He was a student with Professor Hayan Ki. 
And uh, Jeff uh, is currently also a faculty member in University of Windsor, uh, doing, uh, continuing to doing great theoretical uh, work. He was also a student at this department uh, who did very well in, in his career. Now, um, the, what I learned from conversations uh, that I had with Jeff and Professor Key and after, you know, some thinking about this system is that uh, these, you, you can kind of simplify these interactions uh, for a chemist, basically. Um, the Kitaev interaction is an indirect exchange interaction mediated between the iridium D orbitals via oxygen P orbitals. Uh, the direct exchange interact, uh, the um, Heisenberg interaction is predominantly a direct DD interaction. And this um, off diagonal, symmetric off diagonal exchange interaction, this is a combination of these two. And so, what is important in this is that uh, ba basically these materials are, are a venue for bond angle engineering. Because if you engineer the bond angle between iridium oxygen and iridium, you can basically tune this strength, the relative strength of these competing interactions. And by doing so, you can push the system through this global phase diagram. There are not many materials that are known to sort of go on this phase diagram. Sodium iridate, lithium iridate, and ruthenium chloride are the main materials. Um, and what my group has done uh, was to kind of try and make new versions of these materials by using a chemistry technique known as topochemical reaction. So this is that something I learned after my metamorphosis into a chemist, basically. I learned more about these sort of um, uh, exchange interactions. These interactions were actually known quite well to the battery chemists who use a lot of this stuff, uh, but not so much used in the context of condensed matter physics. And so my group, among others, uh, try to implement these techniques to make new versions of these um, sort of Kitaev materials. And the general idea is that you start with known structure of lithium iridate or sodium iridate, then you replace some of the atoms and you get a new structure. For example, this is lithium iridate. We remove the lithium atoms and replace them by silver atoms and made a new material called silver <coughs> lithium iridate. This system has a honeycomb structure of iridium atoms, but between the layers you have silver instead of lithium. And that's an important change in the following sense. Uh, when you have lithium atoms between these layers, the lithium atoms connect to oxygens in an octahedral fashion. But when you replace it with silver, the silver atoms connect to oxygens in a linear coordination. Sometimes we call it a dumbbell coordination. Now, when you change the coordination from octahedral to linear, the oxygens in the layer, they have to move around to make room for that change of coordination. And as they move around, they will change this, the, their bond angles with iridium atoms. So therefore, by changing the interlayer uh, coordination, you're changing the intralayer uh, interactions. And, and if you do that, then you, you can basically change the relative strength of these different indirect and direct exchange interactions. And you would make new materials and put them on this global phase diagram. So we've been, and, and again, um, we don't know exactly when we do an exchange interaction in which direction it goes. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, in the future, we can have more powerful maybe computational techniques to help finding the right direction, but that doesn't prevent a chemist from making new materials. So we can just go ahead and make new materials and have fun with it. So that's, for example, silver lithium iridate, which was made in my group. We found that in this material, the magnetic ordering goes from 15 Kelvin in the parent compound to about eight Kelvin in the new compound. This was detected by a by a NMR uh, uh, measurements as a drop in uh, the relaxation time or one over T1. Also, it was found in mu SR where um, muon spin relaxation uh, shows oscillations when you have a magnetic order. And these oscillations appear at around nine Kelvin in this uh, material, silver lithium iridate. Um, so it has a smaller ordering transition temperature than its parent compound. Um, now, so this is, so then we, we basically did this kind of chemistry on iridium materials. I, uh, my group also made other versions of this system, which I'm not gonna talk about, such as copper iridate or copper lithium iridate, et cetera. Uh, but this was basically a game we played on iridium systems, which are 5D transition metals. And then from there, we moved to 4D transition metals. <laughs> and we had a motivation. There's a reason to do that. And the very simply put, that reason goes as follows. 
When you go from 5D to 4D, uh, the spatial extension of D orbitals uh, shrinks. 5D orbitals are bigger, uh, 4D orbitals are smaller. Uh, and therefore, both this indirect Kitaev interaction and the direct Heisenberg interaction, both of, both of them become weaker, but it so happens, if I understand correctly, that the Heisenberg interactions uh, of, uh, de decay faster than the Kitaev interaction, which means that this ratio of Kitaev to Heisenberg coupling seems to be higher, in fact, in a 4D transition model than a 5D transition model. Um, this was kind of the motivation to go after 4D um, candidates of spin liquid uh, physics. Uh, and for the, you can find two um, sort of 4D ions, uh, rhodium 4 plus and ruthenium 3 plus. Both of them are in this D5 state with the spin half, which is necessary for this physics. Uh, and so these are both candidates to for, for basically uh, making a new Kitaev system. That logic was actually used again in this department in the, uh, at the University of Toronto by the group of uh, Professor Young Jun Kim. Uh, to create this, or to basically introduce this material, ruthenium chloride, as a uh, wonderful candidate for Kitaev spin liquid. Um, this material was known before, but uh, the intuition that this material would be a great candidate for spin liquid came really from here, from University of Toronto. Uh, and it, it um, if you're in condensed matter field, I'm, no, I'm sure you heard of this material. It doesn't matter what you do, but you heard of ruthenium chloride. Uh, it became probably one of maybe one of the most popular materials in the field. Um, and so many other institutions followed the work that was done here at the U of T. Uh, the student who again was a friend of mine at the time where this material was uh, be basically being uh, introduced by um, uh, the group of Professor Young Jun uh, Kim was uh, uh, Ken Kemp Plum. Uh, he was also a very good friend of mine. Uh, this was not at all my actually thesis topic. Uh, I was not doing research on quantum spin liquid, but Kim was a good friend of mine. And of course, Professor Kim was on my uh, committee. So he would, he would uh, basically examine me every year to make sure that I'm doing proper progress. Um, and so I knew about this really exciting physics that they were doing. Um, but at, at the time of my PhD, I was not working on this problem. Uh, but again, Kim did, uh, it was his PhD thesis and he went on to become also a professor in Brown University uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. We are only one hour apart from each other. We meet each other uh, quite often, in fact, and we collaborate together. Uh, so it's, again, another child of this department turned out to be a really successful scientist because of the work that was done here. So um, now, when I started my career, I, I, I basically learned about, I, I could succeed in doing this topotactic exchange reaction in iridate materials, but uh, then I realized, oh, well, 4D systems are even better than 5D systems based on the discovery that was done in Toronto. And then I said, okay, let's do it on 4D systems. And so I, instead of ruthenium 3 plus, I turned to rhodium 4 plus uh, for that experiment. Uh, and the way that basically the reason for that uh, was due to this sort of phase diagram. Here I'm showing the magnetic transition temperature of these Kitaev magnets as a function of what we call Curie-wise temperature. It's a temperature scale that we can deduce from magnetization measurements, and it approximately uh, gives you the strength of magnetic interactions. So how strongly the magnetic moments or the spins interact versus how high is the ordering transition temperature. That's the phase diagram. These iridate materials are all in this corner. Um, they have Curie-wise temperatures of around 100. And the ones on top are the parent compounds. The one at the bottom are the ones that we exchanged and the new versions that we made, such as silver lithium iridate, copper lithium iridate, cop uh, copper sodium iridate, and copper iridate. Um, then this material, the these are all 5D. A ruthenium chloride, which was made here in Toronto, is also shown on the phase diagram. Uh, lithium rhodate, which was the material of our interest, is shown here. This system orders at 6 Kelvin. And so I knew that when we exchange materials, uh, we, we, we do this, when we do this sort of uh, topotactic exchange reaction, the TC goes down. And lithium rhodate has a TC of 6 Kelvin. So then I was like, okay, that's a great idea. We, ex we do the exchange and the TC will go down to zero and we get quantum spin liquid and become really famous. Uh, but that didn't happen as most of my great plans. It didn't work out. And really the TC 
went off the roof, actually. It went from six Kelvin to a hundred Kelvin, completely opposite to what I expected. Um, so that didn't work out, but in fact, we spent the rest of the year figuring out what happened. And we eventually got a nice paper published actually on this material. And very briefly, I'll tell you basically what was the, the lesson, the takeaway lesson from this project. The takeaway lesson was that uh, when you do these exchange reactions, um, you actually change the, you actually change uh, the structure of these uh, uh, rhodium octahedra within the honeycomb layers in the sense that you compress these octahedra this is called a trigonal compression uh, because the silver atoms are um, much less electropositive than the lithium atoms. They let go of these oxygens, and so the oxygens get closer to rhodium atoms, and so the, these uh, rhodium oxygen octahedra get, get squashed. This is called a trigonal compression. And when that happens, um, we can, of course, characterize it, uh, but when that happens, the the spin, the sort of the spin orbital arrangement of the material changes. Uh, this is, for example, the, the, the energy levels for the parent compound lithium rhodate. But here is a different, you have a different arrangement of, of uh, spin orbital levels for this new material, silver lithium rhodate. And we could, in fact, compute the uh, wave function of this, of this new material. And we found that the wave function in this exchange material is different from its parent compound um, in that it has a trigonal symmetry as opposed to the cubic symmetry in its parent compound. And therefore our exchange reaction, although it was successful from a chemistry perspective, but it changed the spin orbital fabric of the wave function of electrons. And that would put the material in a different magnetic regime in a regime in that the system orders at a much higher temperature. So uh, we learned the importance of uh, basically trigonal compression. Um, in fact, it's interesting that after this, I went back to some of the prior publications again uh, from Professor Key and from Professor, Professor Kim's group, and I realized that they had some predictions in fact about this. I just didn't read those, didn't read those papers carefully, but then I went back to those and understood based what is the important thing to look for. Um, okay. So um, we learned about this, this uh, uh, basically we learned about this uh, uh, sort of uh, this phenomenon. Uh, now uh, we had a high temperature magnetic material um, where the TC went from six Kelvin to hundred Kelvin as a function of quote unquote chemical pressure. But then I decided to do the next interesting thing and to basically pressurize this system using physical pressure and I didn't give up on the idea of finding a, a maybe a spin liquid-like phase. Uh, the idea was to put the material under pressure and suppress its magnetic order. And where did I get that idea? Also from my PhD with Professor Julian, in fact. Uh, so um, Professor Julian is an, expect, is, is an expert in something called quantum criticality uh, or quantum phase transitions, something that he has been working on this topic for years. Uh, some of the pioneering experience, uh, especially in, in, field of, in the field of heavy fermions was done by him. Um, and so, he, for example, when I was a PhD student, uh, they were doing this very nice work. One of the PhD students in my group and a postdoc in my group, Alex McCollum, they were basically looking at the suppression of magnetic ordering in a correlated metal, strontium uh, ruthenate, uh, as, a, uh, as a function of pressure and field. These are non-thermal parameters. And eventually you can suppress the magnetic ordering, for example, by pressure or by magnetic field. Uh, and this point where you suppress that continuous uh, transition is called a quantum critical point. Um, so basically I wanted to do the same thing on this material. And, uh, and my PhD was of course on pressure, so it made sense to do that. Um, and I would like to also, um, show uh, uh, a picture of Alex McCollum, who was a PhD student of uh, Professor Julian, who later became a postdoc also in this department in the uh, University of Toronto. And she was in fact the, the first person who taught me experimental physics. She was my experimental mentor in the lab. I learned a lot from her and I'm very, very grateful to everything she taught me. She was a fantastic postdoc, very hands-on, very good experimentalist. Uh, so I was in good hands as a PhD student. Um, so what we basically, what we did is that we pressurized uh, this material. Um, and by the way, Alex is also a faculty. She has been a faculty for a while, but she is currently a faculty at uh, University uh, College Cork in Ireland. Um, again, another uh, postdoc from University of Toronto. Um, okay, so 
Um, the, uh, what we did in this experiment was to get the material and pressurize it. The peak here in magnetic susceptibility represents the magnetic transition temperature. And with increasing pressure, that transition basically went down to smaller and smaller values. And so we saw a very rapid suppression of magnetic ordering in this material with a pretty fast rate of about 20 Kelvin per GPA. It's a really quick rate, actually. And so this was a very exciting experiment. And what happened was that eventually, maybe I passed through this one, eventually we basically lost the magnetic transition. So you see that that peak goes down at higher pressures above four GPA. We just, it, it wasn't, we didn't see a continuous suppression of this peak down the transition uh, or the antiferromagnetic peak to zero values, but we basically lost the, the peak altogether. Um, and, and so uh, maybe about four GPA, we, we, it, it's as if the system does not have that antiferromagnetic ordering anymore. So this was an, an interesting, this is actually this paper, this is unpublished result, it's very recent result. We're working on a paper um, uh, on this, basically on this work. Uh, another interesting finding we had was from muon spin relaxation. Uh, the finding is that at zero pressure, when we do this mu SR experiment, uh, the TC is 100 Kelvin at zero pressure. And immediately below, below TC, we see these oscillations in mu SR. The oscillations tell you that there is a long range magnetic order, which is exactly what you expect. That's, of course, normal. Below the transition temperature, you should have magnetic ordering. Uh, however, at high uh, pressures, at, the two point, uh, at, at around maybe 2.5 GPA, uh, we saw a very different behavior. What we saw is that the TC is about 44 or 45 Kelvin, but you have to go to half of that value in order to see the oscillations appear. So there seems to be at least a qualitative difference between the low pressure and high pressure uh, phase. And so it seems that uh, the this, this suppression of magnetic transition coincides with some serious changes in the, basically in the magnetic interactions in this material. Um, now, another thing that we wanted to check was to also check that there is no structural transition under uh, pressure, such that this suppression of uh, magnetic uh, transition is only due to a, a shift of balance between different competing interactions, such as Kitaev and Heisenberg terms, not due to a structural transition. So we studied uh, the X-rays under pressure, and we saw that there is no structural transition up to 6 GPA, but above that, you see there is a branching of X-ray peaks. And that branching is indeed a structural transition that happens at about 6 GPA. And here is a phase diagram of this material as a function of pressure. The, the nail temperature or the antiferromagnetic transition temperature goes down with uh, pressure and eventually it disappears. Um, this, uh, but however, after it disappears, there is a gap before you start getting a structural uh, transition. This is an important finding because in most of these Kitaev materials, uh, before you can suppress the magnetic ordering, the structural uh, transition kicks in. In most of these materials, the range, the, the pressure range of the structural transition is somewhere here. And so you basically don't see this trend of magnetic transition being suppressed. Before you can suppress the ordering temperature, there is a structural transition. Or, so the material changes its structure and the physics is basically gone. But here we basically, we pre I present this material as a window of opportunity in some sense to look at this, uh, you know, to look at a, a region where you suppress magnetization, mag magnetic transition before you get a structural uh, transition. We have not yet done lower temperature uh, uh, measurements, but of course there is a, an, there could be some interesting possibility at these low temperatures, maybe a new phase. Of course, one would like to find superconductivity in these honeycomb materials, but anyways, we'll see how, how that goes. And of course, um, based on the changes of, based on the changes of the structure, we found that, so the lines here, they show uh, the bond angles. Uh, remember these materials, the, the main uh, uh, thing that we are tuning in these materials is the bond angle between transition metal, oxygen, and transition metal. Here is rhodium, oxygen, rhodium. Uh, as we increase the pressure, we know that the, the, basically these lines show the bond angle at, at different pressures. So this is at zero pressure. Then we go to 2.8 and 5.1. As the bond angles change, the K to J ratio seems to increase. This is, this is a calculation, a quantum chemistry calculation for a lithium rhodate, not silver lithium rhodate, but it's a, a relevant calculation for this material. And so we basically demonstrate that 
uh, probably what we're doing with pressure is to tune the relative strength of these terms in the Hamiltonian of the material, the Kitaev and the Heisenberg term. There could be another interpretation of this physics, uh, again, going back to um, you know, my years as a PhD student, uh, Professor Paramakanti and his student Ganesh have been working on J1, J2, or more recently J1, J3 models of uh, competing interactions on a, on a honeycomb lattice. And this model is also a frustrated model with two different interactions, the nearest neighbor and the next nearest neighbor. And such a model can also be frustrated as long as J2 is antiferromagnetic. If I understand correctly, there is frustration in this model. So with increasing pressure, another interpretation of this data could be within a, a different model, a J1, J2 model, for example. So it's not uh, we're not limited to only K and J, but we can also think about the interactions in different terms. Nevertheless, uh, uh, our understanding of this behavior is that pressure is tuning the relative strength of different interaction in the material. And of course, that was that work was the work of Ganesh, who was also a PhD student around the time where I was around. Ganesh is also has started a, a faculty position. Um, at uh, Brock University in Ontario. So another student from this department who went on to become a, a faculty. Um, okay, so uh, here is, um, okay, I forgot William. So here is the, basically here was maybe the, top, the maybe the most in conclusion that comes out of my talk uh, is, is this, I would say. I, I would like to maybe, uh, well, I showed you some of the work we did. I showed you some of the materials we made and contributions we made to physics. But a lot of this, and I, I believe some success that I had in my career is really rooted in the education that I got in this department. Um, I will be forever grateful for the time I had here, for the wonderful professors who taught me, my own advisor, uh, Professor Julian, and also Professor Paramakanti during my master's, and also members of my advisory committee, Professor uh, Young Jun Kim and Professor Young Ma Kim, Professor Hyun Ki, who taught me condensed matter physics one, uh, and and all the other all the other professors with whom I had courses. This is a wonderful uh, physics department. And sometimes when we are PhD students, we may not realize in what a great environment environment we are. Uh, but it may take maybe ten years or fifteen years for you to understand in from. From, you came from a great place, somewhere that is intellectually uh, very powerful, uh, very stimulating. And I had that opportunity. I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And on that note, I finished my talk. Thank you. <laughs>